but they know we're the guys that you don't shoot because we shoot back, right? <laughs> like, we'll take the fight to you. Uh, my name is Brad Jacobson. I was an Army Ranger for four years, from 2001 to 2005. I was a mortarman in the uh, Second Ranger Battalion. Yeah, so I, I grew up in Washington State. I was raised LDS, so I was a Mormon kid. Um, so I had five brothers and sisters. You know, we went to church every Sunday. Um, by the time I was about 16, though, I stopped being interested in going to church because it was kind of the same routine every day. Um, so I started ditching church and watching football. That was my, that was my go-to. Um, after that, I, uh, I, my parents got divorced when I was 18 um, because my dad had stopped believing in the church too. Um, and I had started smoking pot with my friends. And my mom, for my 18th birthday, gave me a trunk, a chest, to pack all my stuff in so I could move out of her house. I didn't have anywhere to go, so I went and lived with various friends. Um, and then I ended up in one of my friend's trailers behind his parents' house while he was away at college. I had an extension cord for power, no running water. I would sneak into the local health club to take showers, and I was working construction. Uh, the truck that I had at the time started to break down. Um, I had just lost my job. And then I was basically like looking for a way out and the military kind of was calling to me because I just needed a place to sleep. I needed some food. And so I walked into a recruiter's office and I was like, I need something. And he said, well, what do you like to do? And I said, I, you know, I like physical fitness. I like to be challenged. And lucky for me, he was a ex army. Well, he wasn't ex, he was an army ranger, but doing his recruiting, you know, E6 service. Um, so he showed me a couple of videos. At the time when I signed up to be an Army Ranger, I thought Rangers were Forest Service Rangers. I thought they were the same thing. So I thought I was getting into Forest Ranger stuff. Um, so anyways, I went down to MEPS. Uh, <laughs> when I, when I went, went down to MEPS, I had actually like smoked weed a couple of days before that. And so I was really worried about the, the pee test. <laughs> and so I was chugging water all night long, all the next morning. And so I'm sitting in those meetings for MEPS. And I was like, I have to go to the bathroom. So I raised my hand and the guy's like, you know you have to take a pee test in like you know, 30 minutes. I'm like, yeah, I know. So I, I ran out and went pee, came back. 20 minutes into the class, I have to go again. And I'm like, I gotta go again. And I'm like about to pee my pants. And I was like, I just have to go. And he's like, you know you have to take a pee test. I'm like, yeah, I know, but. And so I ran back out and luckily somehow I passed the pee test to get into the <laughs> army. But yeah, that was, that was very fortunate. Talking about your mom giving you that chest at 18, uh, why, why was she so eager to get you out at that time? That's a great question. So my mom was highly religious and because my dad had left the church and I wasn't really following quote unquote the house rules, my dad actually encouraged her to kick me out because she was kind of pulling her hair out. She, you know, she, she didn't have any training or anything. So she, she had basically been a stay at home mom for 18 years. So she didn't know what she was doing to be a single mom. And so she was basically, she just wanted to clear the space and get me out. When I was in elementary school, I was in second grade, a family had moved in up the street from us. Um, and one of their kids was about the same age as me. And I'd gotten on his bad side. And so from second grade all the way up until seventh grade, he had basically just bullied me. You know, there was, he'd smack gum in my hair. There was a time where they ganged up with his friends and put me in a trash can. Um, so it was, it was rough. There was, we would usually just kind of like banter on the walk home from the school bus stop. And there was a point where like, I basically, I would come home and cry. And my dad was like, well, we need to figure this out. So him and my dad and his dad basically got together and like, we'll just let the boys fight it out. And so I went to go fight this kid and he had already been in wrestling for several years and he just like demolished me, smashed my face in the dirt and just was like, you know, say you quit. And that was like a really humiliating experience for me. Um, fast forward a couple years later in seventh grade, I joined the wrestling team and our wrestling coach, Joe Orford. I, I mean, this guy changed my life because he was sort of a masochist and I guess he was a sadist. Um, so he was, what he would have us do is run sprints on the mats. He would have us do 16 sprints, like down and back is one, two, three. He called them sweet 16s and he would have us bid on how fast we could do them. And then every second that we didn't complete them as a team, we'd have to do that many more laps and we would bid on how fast we could do those. Um, but that was just like a small taste of what he would do. He would have us do wall sits and he would walk across our thighs and just yell at us. <laughs> but like in a, you know, an encouraging way, like get your butt up, you know, you got this. And, um, there was one time where he had us hold our arms out and we just did a contest to see who could hold their arms out the highest. Um, well, it got down to me and my bully, the guy that had bullied me since second grade. And we were the last two left. And I remember just looking into his eyes and taking his soul, like watching him slowly lose composure and just give up. And I was the last one standing. And that was, 
that was a really big moment for me because it was sort of like, well, if I can do that, what else can I do? And so from that point forward, I knew that I had mental, like mental strength above like the average person, um, which really helped like when I got out and went into the Rangers, like, you know, a lot of passing their metrics is just a mental game. You know, it's like just knowing that at some point the pain will stop. At some point we will stop doing flutter kicks in the rain. At some point I will get a night's sleep. So that was, that was a great way to, um, to transition into the Rangers. Yeah, so basic training, I was put in a platoon where it, all the guys in my platoon had Ranger contracts. So we were all gonna go through the process together. Um, so there was a lot of like, you know, chest beating and, and stuff like that. Uh, but I remember on our 10th week of basic training, we were out at one of the mount sites, which is like one of the, you know, where you're doing like CQB and stuff. Um, and we were all lined up in formation. And I remember noticing that the drill sergeants on that particular day were all crowded around their vehicles. Like they weren't paying attention to us at all. Um, and then one of them came back and was like, hey man, like our country has just been attacked. And we were like, okay, like, is this a joke? Like, we, cause we don't have any contact. And so he was like, no, somebody flew a plane into the World Trade Centers. And we're like, okay. And then like maybe 30 minutes later, he came back and said someone flew another plane into the Trade Centers. And so, we were, you know, we kind of got, you know, we were chittering and kind of like, well, what are we gonna do? Um, and then we found out it was real like that. At first we thought it was part of the drill just to get us to take training seriously, but then we realized it was real. And, um, and then there was the rumor mill of like, we're gonna deploy right away. You did, we're not even gonna finish basic training. They're just gonna ship us off to Afghanistan. Of course that never happened. But uh, we ended up, you know, out of those 50 guys, you know, most of us went on to airborne school. You know, a small group of them didn't make it through airborne school, which was just because it was a lot of running. Um, if you've been through airborne school, you know, you run everywhere in boots. Um, and then after airborne school, we went to the Ranger indoctrination program, which is where it's a mental suck fest just to see if you're able to handle the shit storm that you're going to have to deal with when you get to Ranger Bat. Um, and so what the instructors will do, and I'm sure it's a lot like Bud's Hell Week, is that the instructors will basically say, we're not going to stop doing this exercise. I mean, we're doing flutter kicks in the rain, um, sprinting back and forth to the wood line, um, low crawling through the mud we're not gonna stop this until somebody quits. And so th what they're doing is they're giving somebody a way out to also be a hero for the group. Like, I'll take one for the team and I'll go quit, you know, stand by the fire. Cause they had a big fire going. This was in November, um, but it was freezing cold out there. So mm. three weeks of that suck fest. Um, I remember one of my buddies, he didn't make it through because something had, somebody had messed up. Um, of course, everybody messes up in that, in that situation. And they made us write the Ranger Creed 50 times, which is, I mean, it's not a short creed, you know, recognizing that I volunteered as a ranger, fully know the hazards of my chosen profession, I'll always endure it, you know. I mean, and there's five stanzas, and then to write it 50 times basically takes you about five hours. And wow. so, you know, we're up all night writing. Well, he was kind of, he was really tough, but he was mentally just kind of a derp. And he, he wrote the first 20, and then he just scribbled the rest of them. <laughs> and he turned it in, and sure enough, he didn't, he, he would have been a great ranger, but he did not make it through. They kicked him out and sent him oh. down the road. So, yeah. You get to Ranger Battalion and basically you have to learn your job and be proficient at your job before they'll send you to Ranger School because Ranger School is a leadership school. Mm. And so they want you to come back from Ranger School and be ready to lead a team. Mm. Um, so what we did was we did our first deployment um, as a private. So I didn't go to Ranger School. I didn't have my tab. Did our first deployment to Afghanistan. We had relieved 1st Battalion who had actually seized Bagram Airfield. We relieved them, basically set up all of Bagram Air Base. Um, and that was our first point. We got back and they were like, okay, we need to send some privates to ranger school. So what we did as a, as a platoon is we, we did a contest. So we did a physical contest. We did a PT test. We did a 12 mile uh, ruck march. We did, um, and then we did a, a proficiency exam like for mortars because we were 11 Charlie. So we were in, we were the indirect fire. And so we did a proficiency exam. It was like a written exam. And then the top three privates, there was probably 20 of us, 25 of us, top three privates, got to go to ranger school and I scored, I think I was the top private. So I scored top PT top. I finished, I finished the 12 mile road march 20 minutes ahead of the second place guy. And like you said, like you're an endurance guy. I was an endurance guy. I was a guy that could throw on the pack and just, you know, like, like just truck. Couldn't run a four minute mile, but I, man, I could do those 12 mile road marches like, wow. like nobody's business. So I got selected to go to ranger school. I left in, um, God, what was it? it was, I think it was like October ish. September, I think it was like, we'd gotten back from our deployment in June. 
Um, cause it was like March, April, May, June, we'd gotten back and we'd done our tests. And I think we deployed for Ranger school in like July ish, but we do a three week pre Ranger with the 75th Ranger regiment. So it's almost like Ranger school is extended by an extra three weeks. <laughs> so you do three weeks of pre Ranger, which is like to introduce you to like, you know, op orders and that sort of stuff. So all of the technical aspects of Ranger school and a little bit of the suck, and then they put you into Ranger school and our Ranger school class started, I think it was in October. Um, but there was 400 people. I remember lining up, there's just like rows of people. And what's really cool about Ranger School is you cut off your ranks. So you've got officers, you've got non-commissioned officers, you've got privates, you know, but nobody knows unless they share what their actual rank is. And that's a good thing because Ranger School is a leadership school. It's like, let's, let's take away food, let's take away sleep, let's see how bad we can make it suck, and then put somebody in charge that doesn't have rank over anybody else and have them lead that group to do a mission. And that's why it's a leadership school. You have to motivate people based on your aptitude, not based on your rank. Mm. So, Range school is hard, I'm not gonna lie. It was, it's like, it goes back to that roulette thing where it's like, as long as you have the right cadre watching you and they approve of how you do your operations, you'll pass. And as long as you're not a total dick to your peers, then you'll pass the peer review process. So there's two, you have to pass a patrol like you have to be in charge of like a squad or a team for an entire patrol and you get graded on how well you do. And then on the flip side of that, you have a peer review process. So your peers in your squad or in your platoon rank you like on based on how nice you are, or, you know, how helpful you were and you know, how big of a dick you were. So if, you, if you're in like the bottom, I forget what percent, you actually recycle the phase and have to do it again. So Ranger School is three phases. You know, you've got jungle phase, mountain phase, and then swamp phase. Um, and you can recycle any one of those phases and they're all three weeks long. So it's a nine week program. Um, so the first phase, you're in the jungle, they start to sleep deprive you, you know, introduce you to the idea of operations. Some people recycle that phase, you get into mountain phase, you learn how to climb cliffs and, you know, rock climb and tie knots and do like mountain, or you do foot patrols like through the mountains and, you know, raids and ambushes. And, and you get graded on like being a squad leader or platoon leader, but then again, you know, you also get peer reviewed. Um, and then I remember in mountain phase, like they had this, <laughs> this was in the first week of mountain phase. And then the next two weeks you're out in the field just sucking. But in the first week they have this mountain breakfast, which is packed full of pancakes, bacon. I mean, this huge breakfast. So after Darby, which is the jungle, you're in mountain phase. And it's like this first week's breakfast is like, oh, right. You <laughs> finally get food again, um, just for breakfast. And then you're, you know, you're on your own for lunch and dinner. Um, but anyways, they didn't keep track of who was going through the, the line. So I remember me and a buddy of mine, we would, we'd go through, we'd eat our breakfast real fast and then we'd hop around in the back of the line and go through again and eat. And as long as we got back and done, you know, back to our barracks in time, like nobody noticed. And I'm sure we would have been recycled or kicked out for that, but you know, you do what you can to survive. The sleep deprivation and the starvation were the most challenging parts of it. And because you're, because you're not being nutritionally, you know, you're not being supplemented with good nutrition and you're not getting good sleep, your hands, like parts of your body start to break down. So you don't heal. Like you get a cut on your hand, it doesn't heal. So you start to collect like these small micro injuries all over your body um, throughout the entire process. And, and your everything, like your muscle tissue breaks down, you know, you, you lose all of your fat dis deposits. By the time you get through to, to jungle phase, or yeah, to swamp phase, like in Florida, like most people are emaciated. So they look like concentration camp victims. Like they, their ribs are exposed. Your biceps turn into these little tiny like balls of like, they look like little golf balls, you know, and like, and your skin pulls away. It's just, it's gnarly. So it was like nonstop training, right? We did deployment, ranger school, and then a deployment right when I got back. And so this was January of 2003. We deployed again to Afghanistan. Um, we spent about a couple months there, but all while we were there, you could see like, you know, they'd be playing the TVs in the chow hall and stuff. And so there was the whole weapons of mass destruction, you know, narrative going on in Iraq. And it was like, oh man, we're going to invade Iraq. Like, like there was a lot of like hype, like this is going to go down. The problem was, is that if you're in Afghanistan and you're in a ranger unit, you're waiting for the other ranger battalion to come relieve you after three months. But then Iraq kicked off in March. And so we got stuck in Afghanistan for an extra three months. We didn't actually know how long we were gonna be stuck there. We were out at one of the uh, Ford operating bases out there, um, just out in the middle of nowhere. It's beautiful country, like don't get me wrong, but we were stuck there and we had no idea when we would be relieved. And that sucks when you're overseas mm -hmm. because you're like, you hear rumors like it could be, I mean, we're talking, this is in February, March, March. And you're like, you hear rumors like, oh, we could be here through Thanksgiving. 
right? We could be through here. Uh, we could be here till Christmas. We could be here all the way until next year. We don't know. They didn't know when we'd be relieved. And so it almost, it almost creates like a depression. You know, if you're, if you're over there and you're not actually doing, um, mounted patrols, if you're not actually doing something and you're just kind of sitting in, you know, a compound, like waiting for something to happen. And then you don't know when you're going home, it creates a lot of depression. You're just like, you have people, I mean, jokingly talking about kickstarting the rifle, you know, if we're not gone by Thanksgiving, I'm just going to end it. Wow. And yeah. We were at this safe house out in Barracout, um, and we had gone in and set it up. Um, but there was a local monkey that would come in to our, to our compound and he would just kind of like come in our tent and like we'd give him food and then he'd go off to another tent. But I remember one time he, we were out doing something like in the compound and he ran up on somebody's head and was sitting up there and they're like, oh, that's so cute. And then he just pissed all over this guy's head. <laughs> was, the guy was just covered in pee. Wow. Um, there was one time we were at that safe house. There was some guys coming in over, we we're close to Pakistan and there were some guys coming over the border that, you know, that were armed with AKs. And so we just lit them up with some 120 millimeter mortars. We come to find out they were actually like the, the Hatfields and the McCoys. They weren't actually coming for us. They were like, they were two warring tribes. And so we ended up inserting ourselves into their battle. We were just like, well, there's guys with like AKs. They gotta be enemies and they could care less about us, but we ended up dropping some bombs on them. We got back from that deployment and we were supposed to be training, I think for six months, cause that was our general rotation cycle was it was three month deployments, um, six months of training at home, right? Like home-based training or doing like, you know, deployments in country, like in the United States, like flying to Kentucky, doing, you know, fixed wing deployments, that kind of stuff. But so we'd have a three month block, we'd be off for six months and then we go deploy again for three months. And that makes sense because every ranger battalion, and there's three of them, right, get a three month block. So it's like second ranger bat, third bat relieves second, first bat relieves third, and then second relieves first. So we had like a rotation going. So we were like, okay, cool. Like, yes, it was a six month deployment, but at least we get six months off, right, before the next one. Boy, were we wrong. So we, we got back, we did a, we did a deployment, um, like a, a training deployment. Um, and then I think it was about the end of October, we get called into this giant theater and our battalion commander is Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel Bailey at the time. He gives this giant speech. It's like, you know, hey man, you know, we've got intel that Afghanistan is gonna be a hot zone and we've got Taliban crossing over the mountains and this time the gloves are coming off. That's what he said, this time the gloves are coming off. And so we were like, okay, cool. Like, and he's like, we're gonna do a surge. We're gonna do it real quick. We're gonna leave next week. I mean, it was like, we had no idea that we were deploying until like a week before we left. And then he was like, it was like, pack your shit, get ready, go, you know, do your checks and we're out. So we fly into Afghanistan, it's in November. And if you know anything about like Afghanistan, it's, it's actually high country. So it's like even Bagram, which is like a, a low flat area is still the high, it's still the elevation of Denver. You know, it's still a mile high. And then you've got like the lower, um, that lower Himalayas, like the Hindu Kush, um, all around Bagram, which it, the peaks are like 15,000 feet. And so you're like, okay, let's think about this. It's November. Who in their bloody right mind is going to be coming from Pakistan over these mountains in the middle of winter to, to come back into Africa? It doesn't make any sense, but they had intel. So anyways, we were, we, we showed up, we, we did a couple of patrols and stuff thinking we were going to make contact and stuff. There was one where we, we literally got in a Chinook and we flew to 12,000 feet. The ground is covered in three feet of snow. Camelback hoses freeze within 30 seconds, right? We, we hop off. We're in this village in the middle of the mountains, no contact. The village is kind of like, what the fuck are you guys doing here? Like, okay, like have some tea, have some food. So like the people were like bringing us food and like sustaining us, but we were just kind of up there like, what the fuck are we doing here? And then of course, because we're eating the local food, everybody caught whatever dysentery, you know? So everyone's like shitting their brains out. Like, like, I mean, we're in the house and you know, you would just see people like peel out of the house and like run out to the nearest wall and just like lose their bowels. So everybody was just like intestinally fucked up for that whole, like that whole mission. You know, eventually get back on our helicopters, fly back to the forward operating base. And we're just like, what are we doing here? I thought the gloves were coming off. And so a buddy of mine, uh, I mean, we started writing songs about uh, Afghanistan and, you know, about ranger stuff. And, you know, we had like a little backpacker guitar that, you know, we were able to take with us, like, you know, out to these operating bases. Um, and so we wrote a song called Ass Slamistan, which, and then like the final line of the song was like, I thought the gloves were coming off. And so it was kind of like a, you know, tongue in cheek at our Lieutenant Colonel for being a douche. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
so anyways, like uh, that, that, was, that was towards the middle of the deployment. At the beginning of the deployment, we had flown into um, Asadabad and we were gonna stage and go set up a new forward operating base. Um, right, it was, now it's called Camp Blessing and we'll talk about why. So we go into, we, go, we fly into Asadabad, we get our mission ready. We're like, hey, we're gonna go, we're basically gonna set up a forward operating base. So we had a ton of equipment that we had to load onto these big trucks. Um, unfortunately, none of the Rangers are, you know, big truck qualified. And so we had to hire some guys from the local army unit that was at Asadabad to drive the trucks for us. So, um, you know, the first time we try to head up and set up this base, you know, we're going up this route called IED Alley, it's Route Blue. Um, and it's just up, you know, up through the Hindu Kush. And it's like, um, you know, and we try to do it at night because, you know, 99% of IDs happen at night. You know, that's, that's how they work. And um, so we load up these trucks. Truck drivers have their night vision on and they're like, they're driving off the road into ditches, you know, like they, they could not pull it off. So we have to turn around, come back into the compound, refigure out what the fuck we're gonna do. Um, and the command goes out like, hey, you guys are gonna do this as a daytime mission. Now, a daytime mission, when you've already, when you've already established, hey, we are gonna go, we are gonna, we're going to attempt to make this route and the locals know that, and then we turn around and come back, restage, and then leave again, it's basically an invitation saying, hey, like, go set up a bomb in the road because we know they're trying to get through this road, right? So they, of course, you know, are gonna do that. So anyways, we set up the whole, like, convoy line. We're gonna leave bright and early in the morning. As we're exiting the gate, the Humvee that I'm in, and I'm, I'm, I'm a mortarman, so I have 120 millimeter mortar rounds, and there's like, I think, two or three to a box. They're about 40 pounds of, you know, explosives each, and I'm sitting on 32 boxes of these rounds in the back of a cargo Humvee. And of course I'm like 19, 20 years old, so I don't really realize the imminent danger of my situation, right? I'm just like chilling on these boxes, you know, bouncing down the road. Um, it's bright and early in the morning. The sun's barely coming up. And, uh, and uh, our, as soon as we exit the gate, like from Asadabad, our Humvee just like the, the radiator hose pops off. I mean, it's like, psh, and we're like, oh shit, turn it off. And so we kind of pull off to the side and the vehicle behind us moves in front of us, right to where we were. So the, the whole convoy kind of is rolling along. We pop the hose, we pull off, the vehicle behind us pulls forward. We luckily had the mechanic in our vehicle. He jumps out, pops the hood, throws the hose back on, screws it on, and we get in line right behind the vehicle that took our spot, right? Um, and then we're going up through the mountains, hours. I mean, this is, you know, highly rocky, not very flat terrain. We're going up through the mountains. And I just remember I'm looking, I'm looking backwards because I'm facing behind us and I'm just sitting there and I'm not gonna lie, and I hope I don't get in trouble for this, but like there's hashish, little bricks that they sell, um, like the locals have them. And if you are friendly with them, you can buy some hashish. So I'd, I'd actually like taken a little bit, like orally, like eaten it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just kind of like buzzing a little bit on the back of this vehicle. And the next thing I know is I hear the loudest explosion to this day that I've ever heard. I mean, it was like, Oh, and it, I mean, we're in a sort of up in the mountains in a valley. So, I mean, this thing shakes the valley. I, I'm facing back. I turn around and look towards the front of the convoy and the vehicle that had taken our spot in that order and that rotation had just been hit with an IED and not a small one. I mean, we're talking a hundred feet in the air was, it was a supply truck, toilet paper, you know, toiletries, toothbrushes, MREs. I mean, it was like it was like a nuclear blast, right? But of our stuff, um, and then it was just like at that point, a switch flips in your brain where you're kind of like in that fight or flight mode where it's like, oh shit, something just happened. Um, and so we dismount, we set up our mortar system. Um, we hear people yelling. They're like, you know, hey, Jay is down by the river. And so Jay Blessing was driving the vehicle, and the IED had in, it initiated right where his feet were, like right, you know, where the gas pedals are. And uh, so it, it actually literally picked his body up and thrown his body a hundred feet. So we're, we're up here, like on this mountain road, right? And the ID went here. And then down here is a riverbed. It had actually blown his body all the way off the cliff down onto the sandy riverbed. And our guys had to like scramble and climb down. And so we had two EMTs go down and try to revive him. But I mean, he was pretty much you know, dead on impact. I mean, he was hemorrhaging in his brain. Um, and then one of my buddies was like, hey, like, do you see that on the other side of the river? 
and no shit, we were up here, you know, on this road, there was down the riverbed and then up on the other side, there's kind of like a grass terrace with like the village where obviously the guy that blew us up was hiding out. And on the edge of the terrace was a boot with a disembodied foot in it. Like his leg had been blown all the way across. That's how powerful the explosion was. Wow. And so I think one of the locals had brought it around to us, but I, I remember just seeing red like for that, for the next two hours, because we sat there on that road doing nothing while the person who was obviously responsible for attacking us was in that village. And in my mind, I was seeing, I wanted to gather up the troops, go across the bridge, because there was a bridge to that, to that, go across the bridge and just start executing people until we found the person that did it. Because they took one of ours, you know? It was like, it just, that, I, that instinct was just to like, be a war criminal at that point. Like I wanted to go commit a war crime. I'm not gonna lie. And yeah, that was hard. That was hard to sit there for that long to, wow. for support to show up. And you know, a helicopter came and flew Jay's body out. But eventually we made our way up to the operating base where we were, you know, it wasn't a base yet. The area that we set up the operating base. And I mean, I remember his foot, his boot with his foot sat on the porch to the little like house that we had surrounded to make our base. And it just sat there for like a week. Oh my God. Rotting, yeah. So, you know, we set up our systems there. And then from that base is where we actually did that mission I told you about earlier, where we flew up into the snow and didn't do anything. So, oh. yeah, that was a rough deployment. So we, it was only a month long. Um, we, you know, it was November 14th was when Jay died and we were back by the end of November. So it was just a month that we were gone. Um, and then we thought we would have some time off, you know, um, and within another two months, we had redeployed again on another surge to Afghanistan in the spring. Um, and so that's where we, I deployed with, uh, I think it was 2nd Platoon Alpha Company, which were known as the Black Sheep. Um, and uh, Pat Tillman was also a member of that, 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 uh, that platoon. Mm. Um, and so what we did was, my, because I was an indirect fire, my team was assigned to that platoon. So I traveled all over with that platoon as their support. Um, and so we were, you know, we'd sit in the powwows and the, the meetings and stuff and get like, you know, the sit, sit reps and, and then go do our missions. So a lot of that deployment was, well, let's, let's, let's back up. So what was happening was because the United States was so distracted in Iraq with the Iraq war is that it was giving motivation to the Taliban to start pushing across the border of Pakistan. Cause we were sort of like, Afghanistan was sort of being ignored. It was like the stepchild of the war at that point. And so it was pulling back a lot of our forces, which was allowing the Taliban to start moving across the borders. And so that's why we did that mission. And so what we did was we drove out to, um, I forget the name of it, it was Asadabad probably again, but then we drove down to border crossing point five and border crossing point five was just like, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was uh, what do you call it when they're, it was manned by the AMF, by the Afghani mil militia, which was trained by the CIA and like the Green Berets. And so they were just watching the border point, but we had gotten some intel from a CIA operative that said that there was gonna be a bunch of Taliban, like they were massing together in Pakistan, they were gonna be coming across the border over this night. And so we, we had all set up, we had our body armor on, our kits on, locked and loaded. I mean, we were ready to just, I, I mean, we're looking through our, our night vision, like I'm looking for silhouettes to start coming, like all night long, because that was the intel we had and nothing happened. And so it was kind of like a big letdown because you know, like we hadn't been in a firefight, like a real firefight yet. We were hoping this would be the time we could just kill the enemy, like kill some terrorists, right? Um, and so we did some other foot patrols and stuff around that time and, and it had gotten really rainy. Um, it was like kind of during the wet season, at least for Afghanistan. And so what was, what was kind of interesting is we have this convoy of Humvees um, and one of the Humvees we had actually acquired. It wasn't even ours. It wasn't even on our books. We had, it, somebody, somebody had left it. One of the other army units had left it in Bagram, just like sitting on the airfield, like it was broken down. And our mechanics had actually commandeered it and fixed it and then made it one of ours. And so this vehicle was with us in that, in that, um, in that deployment and it was working just fine. And then, um, and then in one day, like at border crossing point five, it just stopped turning on. Like we didn't know what to do. So our mechanic called in, he thought it was a, the fuel pump, it wasn't, he had switched it out overnight, but we had wasted like maybe a day or two because of this broken Humvee. And so we were like, well, what are we gonna do? Well, it had rained really hard the night before. And, uh, and our, our command talk was like, you guys need to just like 
freaking tow it, you know? And so the, the mechanic like hooked up a tow strap to it. There's a couple guys in the vehicle to kind of steer it, right? Even though it wasn't running. Um, but it, it had just rained. And so um, we're, we're towing this Humvee like across this like super muddy terrain. I just remember it like part of it was just like sliding, you know, like the, yeah. the Humvee was sliding. So of course it was like getting beat the fuck up. Um, and after, you know, maybe an hour or two of driving and we'd only on a couple miles, the, the front axle completely disintegrated. Like the tie rods broke and the wheels were just like, they weren't facing the same direction. They were just, they were just being drugged. And it was, I think maybe we even broke the toe strap. I don't know, but it was like, it was, it was dead. And so we're sitting here with this Humvee that was broken down. It wasn't ours. It wasn't on the books. And so we were like, okay, well, what do we do with it? You know, it, we can't fix it in place. Um, so we called in for, uh, I forget what they're called, but it's where the helicopter comes in and like picks up the vehicle and, you know, and it was standard operating procedure for Rangers. And so we called it in they're like, you know, sorry, we don't, you know, you have to call four days in advance to get these helicopters out. And we're like, well, shit, what do we do then? So a lot of the guys were like, let's thermo grenade that shit. Let's like, let's burn it in place, destroy it. It's not ours. It's not on our books. Who gives a shit, right? They would not let us do that. And so like, well, we were kind of just stuck in place and we were just, we were, we were basically in this like small little valley. There's a, there were some houses and you know, it was a small little village. Um, and so we were just stuck in place with this broken Humvee and it was like 10 o'clock in the morning, all the kids were coming down and it was just starting to get kind of like, there was like a buzz in the air, you know, you got the village, we're the spectacle of the year, you know, like look at these guys and they, they know who we are because we wear different patches, right? Mm. A lot of the guys like won't engage it. A lot of the militia over there won't engage us, the Taliban, because they see our patch. They know that they don't know what unit we are, but they know we're the guys that you don't shoot because we shoot back, right? Mm. Like we'll take the fight to you. Um, and like so they know you're not just some supply company. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They're like, Oh yeah. They, these are the guys that don't have doors on their Humvees. <laughs> like, mm. like don't fuck with them. Um, and so we just sat there for a while. Well, uh, eventually a guy came down and he was like, Hey, I can tow your Humvee if you just like jack it up and you know, you can chain it to the back of my Jenga truck, which is like a, it's an Afghani semi, right? That's kind of an off wheel vehicle, off road vehicle. And so we were like, well, sh we don't really have any other choice. Um, our platoon leader at the time, his name was Lieutenant Utlaut. He had called ahead, obviously he was in communication with the talk and he was like, hey, listen guys, like we got the broken Humvee, like we got a couple options, you know, um, one of them's to split the platoon. One of them's to keep the platoon together, take the, you know, follow the Jenga truck to the hard top where a, a wrecker can come in and, you know, take it off. The wrecker couldn't make it to us. It could only be on the hard top. Um, he's, and Lieutenant Utlaut was very adamant that he did not want to split the platoon. Like, you know, he was like, I don't want to split my guys up. That would make us combat ineffective, right? To split us into two squads here, two squads there, you know, and it's super dangerous. I mean, like, yeah, we hadn't made contact since we had been on the ground, but you know, you're in enemy territory. I mean, we were in the, uh, I forget the name of the, the province, but it was like a, a hotbed of Taliban activity. And you could tell just by looking at the village, the guys that were in their twenties and thirties did not want us there. They were just kind of like standing back and, you know, and, and little did we know that there were some plans going on this whole time. Um, and even the Jenga truck driver that volunteered to drive our truck was part of this plan. Um, so anyways, after a lot of you know, back and forth with out in the talk. The talk was basically just like, listen, you need to split the platoon. We need boots on the ground um, by nightfall across the valley over here because you have to clear this village for weapon caches and things like that. And then you guys can kind of link up together and go back to the Salerno. Salerno was the operating base, that's it. Uh, so anyways, you know, Utlaut was like, he, he did everything he could to say no. Sergeant Godick was also the platoon sergeant and he, he was not about it. The squad leaders were not about it. They're like, God, this is the dumbest fucking like combat decision that we, you can make is to, to make a combat unit ineffective is to split them up, right? Um, Cause you want three to one advantage on the enemy. And when you start, you know, winnowing down your, <laughs> the squad you're moving with, like you're not gonna have three to one and you know, you're more likely to take casualties. So what, what we ended up doing is we put the, the Jenga, we put the, we put the Humvee on the back of the Jenga truck and we, we had serial one, which was going to go, um, kind of left or West through this Canyon, this giant Canyon. Um, and then the village was on the other side of that Canyon. And then the other serial was going to go the same way that we had come down to border crossing point five. It's kind of like over this overpass and then onto the, towards the flat top, um, where the wrecker would meet us. 
And so we were gonna go the opposite way. So they were gonna, serial one was gonna go left, we were gonna go right, go up through this pass and get on the hard top. So serial one takes off, they go, they go left. Um, we get up to the, the T intersection and we take a right, just like we're supposed to. Well, the Jenga truck was in the back at this point, right? He gets to the intersection and he goes, hey, dudes, we are not going up that pass. Cause we like in our Humvees and our off-road Humvees, we barely made it down that pass. And so he was like, listen, dude, I cannot take my truck up that pass. It's way, he's like, it's way better if we just go through that Canyon cause it'll eventually meet up at the same hard top just further down the road, right? Not as close to Salerno, but we'll make it there safer. You know, I'm not gonna roll off the mountain cause that pathway was just like a goat trail up the mountain. It was, it was horrible. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it made sense to like our platoon cause we had already done that track and we're like, yeah, you know, that would suck to go back up there. So. What ended up happening was the Jenga truck took a left and started to follow Serial One through the canyon. They were already 15 minutes ahead of us because we kind of stopped and argued for a while, right? And so he gets in front of all of us and we all kind of turn around and now we're behind him as he enters the canyon. And so the sun is starting to set, it's still up and it's casting some dark shadows and weird things in this canyon. And this canyon, I mean, if you've ever been to the Grand Canyon, you know what a canyon looks like. Well, think Grand Canyon, but narrow right? Super high walls, super narrow. And the road, the road bed that goes through the middle is only, it's like one track like road and there's just boulders on every side. So there's like, there's no way to go around somebody that's in front of you. So we, we end up going through this canyon. We're kind of looking around and it's like, I mean, obviously there's, you know, the, the feeling, the atmosphere in the air is this is like, not where you want to be. We're in the low ground with high ground way above us, right? We've got a Jenga truck in front of us. And it's driven by somebody we don't even know. And then you start to hear the bombs. And, and so you, the first one dropped between a couple of vehicles, boom. And, you know, and we're like, what was that? You know, and then boom. And we're like, oh, it's got, it's an, our mental game. We're like, it's an IED. Somebody's trying to blow us up. But then a few more drops and then small arms fire. And we're like, those were mortars. They had actually zeroed in on that position in the canyon while we were kind of parked back in the village. They had must have set up some mortar, mortar systems and had targeted that area. And then, so it was basically an ambush. So mortar rounds were dropping, small arms fire started coming down and the Jenga truck driver stops and gets out of his vehicle. So we all know like in an ambush, you return fire at a high rate and then you get the F out of there, right? Like there, you don't hang out in the fucking kill zone, right? But when the Jenga truck driver stops and you're, you're stuck in the kill zone, like, I mean, what else do you do? So we all jump out of our vehicles and we're just returning fire at whatever's moving on the, on the um, cliffs, cliff tops above us. Eventually the squad leader goes and grabs the Jenga truck driver, throws him back in, puts a gun to his head and says, drive your fucking truck. So the guy, you know, goes a little bit further down the road and through this canyon, still super high walls. We're, we're trying to communicate with each other. People are stepping on each other's radios. Nobody knows what's going on. Um, and then the Jenga truck driver saw, stops again and gets out and runs again. And, and so all of our vehicles, you know, come to a screeching halt. We still got small arms fire coming down on top of us. And I remember like I, at this point, like I jumped out of my vehicle. I forgot to put it in park. I was driving. I jump out of the vehicle. It rolls into the one in front of us. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm hiding behind a rock um, and just looking, I'm looking for targets, but I don't see anything. I hear stuff, I hear people, shoot, sh people shooting everywhere, but I honestly, like, I don't see anything. And at this point, uh, my, my platoon sergeant sitting in the seat next to me, and we're mortars, so we have a little 60 handheld mortar, and so we just run around, we set up the tube. He's like, hey, you ready? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, he drops around, he's like, just put it up there on top of the cliff. I'm like, all right, clink, clink, clink. <laughs> we're like, well, what the fuck? And so he was so nervous, we were so like nervous, he forgot to pull the pin. So we had to like pick up the tube, slowly like let the round slide out, pop the pin, throw it back in, and then like shoot the round up there. I don't know if I hit anybody, but you know, we all get back in the vehicles and the people that had combat experience, like command sergeant major, oh, I forget his name, but he was the command sergeant major of the Ranger Regiment, was in my Humvee when that first started. He had hopped out, I mean, he, this is an old Delta Force guy, you know, used to have a huge beard, you know, big burly dude. And he's just like calmly walking down the road just looking, he's not shooting anything cause he doesn't see anything, you know? And so like, that's, that's who you want to be, right? But who we were was like very anxious. 
um, trapped, like, you know, you think about it, like you're trapped because this guy keeps stopping, you got small arms fire coming down. So you can almost think like you're, you're a ticking time bomb of anxiety, you know? The, like the, the driver that ran, did you guys let him go or did you go after him? Uh, yeah, eventually, like eventually we ran him down and drug him back, threw him in his truck. Mm -hmm. Eventually it gets to a spot in the canyon where it kind of opens up a little bit wider. And so all the vehicles start going past him. Um, and by this time, I mean, several minutes have gone by, the, the sun had set behind the mountains. And so there was this, there was this weird like contrast where the sky was super bright, but the canyon was super dark. Like as we were coming out, it was very dim. Um, it was very hard to see. It was too light to use night vision, but it was too dark to really like identify people, you know, well. Um, and so the first, the first, um, the first Humvees, like, well, let's back up the, the first serial that had gone through the canyon before us had heard us getting ambushed and they had parked their vehicles, gotten out and set up blocking positions, right? As we were coming out of the canyon. Um, and so the canyon, basically it's super narrow, um, but eventually it starts to kind of like, you know, drop down in elevation and kind of flatten out a little bit. And they were kind of set up on one of the spurs. Um, as the canyon was flattening out, they were set up on one of the spurs and the first vehicle in the convoy, I don't know if they were just like freaking out or what, but they were literally shooting anything and everything that, that they could identify as a possible living target. Um, and, and so, so anyways, they're, they're just lighting everybody up and I'm in my Humvee. I'm about three back from the front and I'm driving and I'm freaking out too. I don't know where serial one is. I didn't even know they they stopped, right? Nobody knew they stopped because we didn't have comms with them. And so we're coming out of the canyon and I hear my Sar Sergeant Horney, um, rest in peace, Sergeant Horney is like, hey, those are, those are friendlies up there. Those are friendlies. Hey, those are friendly. They're shooting at friendlies. Like I could hear him like kind of exasperating, yelling. And so eventually we all get up to um, where Serial One's vehicles were, which was an obvious stop point because you're like, well, there's our guy's trucks. So we pull off to the side, I stop, I have a radio. And I hear somebody calling like, you know, we have Tango down, or uh, we have an Eagle down, uh, Tango, Eagle down, Tango. And then an Eagle down is like, you know, KIA on the battlefield. And I'm thinking, Tango, like who the fuck is Tango? Like from Alpha Company, right? Um, and my first, in, my first inclination was, I forget the guy's name, is like Trufo or something. And I was like, man, Trufo fucking died. Like, no, dude, that's a good dude. And they were like, we need a Skedco, we need a Skedco, which is like a plastic sled that you can, you know, wrap bodies in. So I immediately run up and I cut the Skedco off the back of my truck. Cause I'm like, everybody's like shell shocked around me. Um, they're just kind of like standing there, like with their weapons and nobody really knows what's going on. So I run up, cut the Skedco. Cause I don't know, for some reason, like I'm just a person of action. Like if like I have to be doing, that's why, that's why I had that inclination, you know, with Jay Blessing where it was like, I just well, like I have to, like, I want to go like, just start executing people to figure out who killed our guy. You know, and so I'm like, when I hear somebody like, hey, do this, I'm like, boom, cut the Skedco. So I run it up the hill, drop it off. I'm pulling security and um, they wrapped the bodies of the dead people into the, into the Skedcos and we carried them down. And uh, it was at that point, I think when I was at the top of that hill and I had passed the Skedco off, I was like, well, who is it? And they said, it's Pat. And I'm like, Pat. Oh, it's Pat. Like Tillman, like. And I didn't know what had happened at that point, you know, because I was driving and stuff. Um, but I eventually we packed them up and we brought them down, loaded their bodies onto helicopters that came in and, and, and took them out. And it was just like this. I just remember because Pat's brother, Kevin, was in our serial, the second one that got ambushed, but he was at the very back. And so by the time they'd gotten out of the canyon and stopped, um, you know, we had already packaged up his brother and man, he was like, he, he was distraught, obviously, you know, and he was like, well, who is it? Like, who is it? Who is it? And eventually, like, they ended up telling him, and I remember, I'll never forget it to this, to this day, like, I'm, I'm in, I'm pulling security, and I just hear this blood-curdling scream, and it's like, it's the most haunting sound you'll ever hear. It's probably the same sound of a, you know, if a mother, like, watches her kid get ran over by a car. I mean, you can imagine just, like, the hair pulling, screaming, and it haunts me, like, to this day, just to, just to reflect on that, you know, like what that must have been like for him because they weren't just brothers. They were like, they were like the same person, you know, like they were almost like twins. Right. Mm -hmm. So anyways, like that night, I mean, just the next day or two was just awful. You know, I mean, obviously like Kevin flew out, but our platoon leader had been hit by one of the grenadiers, um, from, from our serial. So there was just a lot of like crossfire 
that had happened is we came out of the canyon. And one of the most challenging things for me, I mean, even to this day, and I'm going through therapy for it, is like, do I know for a fact that I would not have pulled the trigger? I don't, right? Like, I was also in a state of like panic, you know? And maybe those guys were super trigger happy. I've, I've had plenty of years, I mean, this is 2004, so I've had, you know, 19 years to reflect on this. And it's like, do I know for certain that if in their same position that I would have done it different? I don't. And so that's really hard to swallow is it's like, you know, it's like you could have been that person that pulled the trigger. And I can't even imagine what those guys have to live with, you know, every day, knowing that they were the ones that killed him. Wow, man. Um, so this, so they were up there because of the split, because you guys split, right? Mm -hmm. And you just had no idea what position they went to. Exactly, yeah. There was no radio, because I mean, everyone's stepping on each other, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, it was, to me, it was obvious as we drove past the kind of spur that they were on. And as I looked back, I could see their uniforms and their helmets. And, I, and apparently that first Humvee, as they passed, kept shooting, just blasting the hillside. And that uh, the, the, the saw gunner that was on that first vehicle that should have been facing the opposite way, heard his buddies on this side shooting, turned his gun to that side. And he was the one that actually shot Pat. Uh, and I think he, at that point, that's just being trigger happy. That's not watching your own sector. That's just wanting to get in the firefight. And so maybe that's, I don't know, that's, that's tough. Ooh, that's real tough. Yeah. And so what did you, um, I mean, and so initially this story is just all over the place. It sounds like it came out very inaccurate, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think Pat was uh, like awarded the, the silver star or something, yeah. Yeah. right? Um, um, and they made up some story. Is that, am I right? You're hundred yeah. percent right. So the, in order to get a silver star, you have to have like two witness statements, right? And one of the, sorry, I've got the water. That's right. totally cool. Don't worry. <laughs> All right. So there's two witness statements. Um, one of them was by a friend of mine, Mel Ward. He was one of the team leaders for that squad, um, for Sergeant Weeks' squad, which was in that first serial. Um, and, and he does, he's like, I didn't write this and it didn't have a signature on it and it got pushed all the way to the secretary of the army and he signed off on it and they gave him a silver star um, for valor based on an erroneous witness statement by one of the team leaders that were on site. And I think one of the reasons why, I mean, we can, we can talk about this a little bit is that the public perception of the wars was starting to drop. Like it was like, I forget what had happened over in Iraq, but it, maybe it was like Fallujah. They had dragged bodies of people through the streets and you know, like it was not a good PR image at the time. And so when Pat died, they were using the collective ignorance of how the circumstance in order to spin it right into such a way where people were like, oh, it's actually, you know, this guy that sacrificed an NFL contract, you know, like saved his buddies lives. like. They were using it to spin the narrative back into the positive frame, even though everyone from that platoon knew that it was friendly fire that night. Wow. I didn't know it was friendly fire until the next morning because I wasn't kind of part of that whole platoon, but I was definitely like close enough to the people that, you know, like it got back around to me like, oh no, 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 that first vehicle was the one that killed him. And so, yeah, that was a rough, that was a rough day. The next day, cause we didn't, I mean, God, who could sleep that night? Right. The next day, you know, we're up pulling security while they went and cleared that village that had to be cleared. Right. Um, and so basically it was just, you know, bad command decision, you know, to split the platoon um, and just like getting boots on the ground by nightfall was just, uh, you know, we're moving. We've been stationary. The enemy knows there's only two routes and they know they're the only one we're probably going to take. And so it was like it was this perfect storm of like. You've got a broken Humvee that doesn't belong to you, could have just gotten rid of it, right? You had a, a decision to split the platoon and it, and it was adamantly opposed by the people on the ground who know best, right? After the Jay Blessing incident and after Pat Tillman, I no longer have trust in authority. I'm working through that as, a, as therapy, right? Um, but I, that was one of my stuck points that I talk with my therapist about constantly is like, I do not trust corporations. I don't trust people that have a, that are in authority positions. I don't trust them. I can't, and I don't respect them either, just because of their position. Mm -hmm. Because I know people at that positions make bad choices that affect people's lives in negative ways. And so, I'm trying to work through that, but like that's still really hard for me to to yeah. swallow. We redeployed, obviously, back to Fort Lewis, right? And at that point. 
I think it was the end of April. So the stories were coming out about his death and they were doing the memorial services and stuff about the same time that we were coming back into Fort Lewis, right? And you've got a platoon full of guys that know exactly what happened, um, you know, and, and several other attachments that knew exactly what happened. And so we had had a couple of meetings like in conference rooms, like where we talked through stuff and we talked, you know, we they discussed like the, they had been doing investigations into what happened and they were kind of like, hey, this is what we're gonna say has happened. Um, make sure this is what you're saying if you ever talk about it. So there was a lot of that sort of like trying to cull the narrative, right? But there was many, many people that were there that were, you could tell it was, it was eating their soul to, to be told not to tell the truth and not be allowed to talk about something that they know, you know, like not be able to talk truthfully about something. Um, it, you could tell it was just eating them alive, like mm. everybody that was there, for sure. They hired Captain Scott to do the initial investigation, which was already a mistake. He was a captain, not that he did a bad job. In fact, he actually probably did one of the better jobs because he interviewed every single person that was there, got their witness statements, put them all together. And his, his recommendation was like, you know, there may have been criminal there might be something criminal in how this was handled, um, which didn't look good, obviously. And he was concluded it was done, it was fratricide, right? So he had the full statement, but they, they canned it and then did another one, uh, or sorry, he had the whole investigation, they canned it and started another investigation. I believe that investigation was the one that was actually accepted for a minute. And that one was also fratricide, but I think it had sort of a different narrative to, that, to the fratricide. Um, and that one was scrapped. And then like, even after I got out of the military, they were still doing investigations. And I remember being called up by, I forget, it was, it was like a CIA or some, you know, some special like, uh, what are they called, IG guys, you know, like the inspector generals were yeah. doing like, so I've been called up out of college, like I'm in college and they were like, hey, talk to me about this event. He's like, here's your witness statement. I'm like, my witness statement? He's like, yeah, go ahead and read through it. Let me know if, and I'm, I'm looking through it and I'm like, I didn't fucking write this. Wow. Somebody had written and fabricated my statement to finish the investigation, right? Because everybody on the ground that, you know, the roster had to be accounted for with witness statements saying that I, I didn't hear predator drones. I didn't, you know, it was like, and it was written in, I mean, I'm reading through it. I'm like, I would never say it this way. I would never say it that way. And, and it was signed by me. Wow. So they were fabricating the investigation around his death. Holy crap. And I told Kevin this because Kevin, Kevin started his own investigation as well because he wasn't satisfied with the way that they were spinning the story. And so, I mean, God fucking bless Kevin's heart. Like if he's out there, like, I love you, Kevin. Like, and then I, I would love to like connect with him again. Um, and I have like, like after we got out, we connected several times because he lives, he lived in Arizona for, for a little bit. Um, but like, yeah, he was doing a lot of investigation work going before Congress, like trying to get people's statements together to show the level of neglect and also maliciousness of our United States government to try to cover this up, to spin it, to, you know, gain propaganda for the war and, you know, in favor for the war. Um, and so I had let him know about this statement too. I was like, listen, man, like they're fabricating statements. And so I had actually like, I, writ I wrote a sworn statement that he presented to Congress among other ones that was like, yeah, I have a fabricated statement that was signed by me, but not wow. signed by me, you know. Going back when you mentioned uh, potentially criminal, mm -hmm. do you mean like intentional? I mean like criminal neglect. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Like, mm -hmm. like there was some stupid fucking decisions made mm, got you, got criminal you. decision like like that goes against standard operating procedure mm. just to follow a timeline you know yeah. just and again this goes back to my distrust of authorities it's like you have guys that are sitting in a talk warm and cozy go get their cup of coffee and they have a map in front of them and they have pins on the map and they're like this pin needs to go here and they don't listen to feedback from the people on the ground about how the best way to get there would be you know to execute that movement they just like, no, just get there. Like, I don't care how you do it. And then the person below them's like, well, okay, I guess we'll have to split the platoon, you know, and then they give that order. So it's like, no matter what, I always circle this back to the Colonel, Colonel Bailey, because he's the one that's, you know, sending us on these deployments. He's the one that's pushing the Donald Rumsfeld, that's right, Donald, you know, the secretary of whatever is, 
fucking war dude, secretary of defense. You know, he's pushing his agenda, right? He's pushing it through, but you know, it's going through filters, it's going through layers. And it's just like, by the time it gets to you, it's like, just do it. You know, like, I don't care if it puts you and everyone else at risk. Like we need to get this unit from here to there. Mm. And that is what created my complete distrust of like authority and, you know, bureaucratic organizations. So that was, that was kind of my third year of being in the military. Mm -hmm. um, we had done another combat deployment after that in the summer. So, I mean, it was like, we got back from that home for two months, another three month deployment. I was fucking done. Like I did not want it. That was my fifth deployment. I'm like, I don't want to do this anymore. And I saw an out and my out was the best ranger competition. Cause as I said before, I'm like, I just have this endurance that, you know, like I want to, I want to challenge it, you know, with other people. So I walked in, it was November. I walked in my platoon sergeant's office and I said, Hey, I want to do best ranger. And he just like looked at me like, okay, okay. Do you have a partner? I'm like, no, I just want to do it. I'll find one. He's like, okay. He's like, well, what do you need? I'm like, I just want to be allowed to do PT on my own. And, that, and he's like, okay. So he's actually really helpful. And so uh, from that point in November, I split from the platoon and I just did my own training. So I did my own PT, right? I mean, I check in and tell him what I was doing and stuff, but I literally was just working out. Like, <laughs> like that was my job was just to work out and get ready for best ranger. And so I did that from November all the way until like, I think it was March or February. And then I flew, I got like orders. I got to go to Fort Benning and just like, stay in a nice place and like work out with the guys that were all part of regiment that were going to be in best ranger and then i did the best ranger competition in april of that what, year. what is that for uh oh the best ranger best competition ranger? Yeah, yeah so the best ranger competition is just like it's a three-day event and it's a freaking suck fest like you get three mres for like the whole event um you have to you only get you don't get resupplied with anything you get three mres and then it's like it's just event after event so it's like you know um shooting ranges, like putting weapons together, like uh, jumping out of an airplane, how close can you land your parachute into this drop zone? So everything is like a scored event, land navigation. Um, I mean, I forget most of them, but so anyways, like at the end of the first, at the end of the first day of all these events, like you have an unknown distance road march. And the way they work this is that they keep track of all of the teams. There was 23 teams um, and they keep track of the teams and they'll put the finish line wherever half of the teams won't finish in the allotted time. So they keep track and it started to rain on this road march. I mean, it was like pissing rain on us. And I think we were one of the last teams to make it across the finish line and the other teams behind us all got eliminated. I mean, it was like, we were right at that six hour mark. So it was like six hours of road marching, right? But it was like unknown distance, right? Oh. So, and then, then you go to a shooting range at night and then the next day there's all these events like climbing a Prusik tower, you know, putting weapons together, throwing axes. I forget, there's just so much stuff. And then at the end of that night, so it's one day, no sleep, another day of activities. And then that night you're doing uh, land navigation. So it's like, however many points you can find overnight gives you points, right? And you have to get at least like a certain amount. And so me and my partner are just like out there in the woods, like walking 26 miles through rugged terrain, trying to find all these points, you know, eventually you come back and then like, I think it ends at 4 a.m. and then you have like an obstacle course and then you have to like jump out of a helicopter into a lake with all your packs like waterproofed and swim and then there's like a, a ruck run after that to the finish line. So it's like three days of like intense activity. And uh, so out of 23 teams, 11 finished and me and my partner finished seventh. Wow. Yeah, so it was, it was a good showing. Um, and my partner was from third bat. He had just gotten back from deployment like two weeks before the competition. He had two weeks to train. Holy shit. Yeah, yeah. Because my initial partner got injured, you know, that, that I'd been training with before. And so the guy that I actually did it with, he had only been back for two weeks, but he was hard as he was hard as fucking nails, dude. This guy, his name is Nofsker, and I can I can't find him. I've always I've looked up, tried to find him since then, but he was hard as nails. My original partner was a bitch. Like, sorry, but he was. Um, <laughs> he complained about everything. And he ended up doing the competition with somebody else because I actually dropped him. I said, I don't want to be on this guy's team. Um, and so that's when I picked up Nofsker and Nofsker had just come off deployment for two weeks and he was like, yeah, fuck yeah, I'll do it. And so like, you know, we did this competition together, but he was hard as nails. And the guy that I was partners with, he quit at that first road march. Oh, wow. Like on the first night. And so that would have been my team, right? So I, luckily I had Nofsker to finish yeah. it with. But yeah, so right after that, I got back. Our whole unit had deployed again <laughs> by the time I got back. So I was on rear detachment for the last month or so and then ETS and got out. And um, so I eventually moved to Arizona um, from Washington and then I started community college there. And that's kind of where you wanted to talk about the transition, right? Yeah, yeah. What, what was that 
like for you? You know, after experiencing everything you experienced in the army, um, uh, trying to transition back into the civilian world. Yeah, I, I know a lot of people talk about transitioning is, is challenging because what you're doing is so you have a domain of experience, right? Um, for a two year old, their domain of experience means that uh, maybe like running half a block would be super challenging for a two year old, right? They just learned how to walk, running a block, half a block would be super challenging. Their domain of experience means that they would find that challenging. Um, most civilians domains of experience is like, uh, you know, the grocery store was out of fucking cheese, you know, like, like it's now I don't know how to make my enchiladas tonight. You know, you know what I mean? Like that's their domain of stress and anxiety. And then when you're coming out of the military and your domain of experience is like, I survived an IED in an ambush. What you think is hard is not even on my radar. It's hard to, I guess it's hard to come together with people like, or integrate yourself with, with a society where the average person is like that. You know what I mean? And so I think that's the hardest part about transition is just like the domains of experience don't overlap in the, in the same way. Um, but I didn't realize when I, when I got out that I was coping, like I was coping with the negative emotions of going through combat and all of those experiences. Um, and so I gravitated towards using opiates as a way to, you know, take myself out of the alert state, you know, cause you're always like kind of in that fight or flight and to numb down the pain. So I, I got addicted to opiates, like heavily addicted um, for the first four years that I was out, four or five years. And my metric for progress was I'm in college, I'm getting good grades. I was making straight A's like through college. Although I was using, like I was going to the restroom to blow lines of Oxycontin in between classes. Do you know what I mean? So to me, like I was like, well, I'm just making it work. But I didn't realize that I was just coping with trauma in that way. Um, and so, yeah, that was, that was, that was rough. I, I started a band, you know, and I just remember like, me and the drummer were just like blowing lines of, of opiates like before shows. And I mean, it was like, I could see like, as I projected forward, I could see like the long-term consequence was like, I'm not gonna make it to 30 years old if I stay on this pathway, but I didn't know where to turn. And, and, and if you've ever been addicted to something, you know how hard it is to come off of it because you feel ex exponentially more vulnerable when you come off of your comfort drug. Right? You're just like open and vulnerable and, and things don't feel right and like emotions are all over the place. Um, but I had a friend of mine that, um, that I met in one of, my, one of my biology classes was a yoga teacher and he was like, well, have you ever tried yoga? And I'm like, no, man, I'm like, my body's broken from rangers. I'm like, my back hurts all the time. I like, I don't, he's like, just come to one. So I, I went to one of his classes in the morning. I, I had this habit of like, I wouldn't use opiates until like after noon, you know, it was like one of those weird wino things, you know? And so it was in the morning and I, I remember coming out of that class and I was just like, fuck, I feel relief. I feel like that sense of relief, you know, like, and it was like, it was, it was a sustainable feeling because the opiate thing will drop off and then you'll need more. And, it, and with the yoga thing, it was like, I didn't, there was no substance involved. It was like, I did an activity and I feel this way. And I was like, there might be something to this. So I gradually made this transition of my drug of choice was opiates to my drug of choice was yoga. And so I began to do like hours of yoga each day. Just my body went from being stiff and broken to being able to be hyper flexible um, I even got to the point where mentally I was starting to feel a little more clarity and I was like, man, I got to get certified. So I got yoga teacher certified um, in that time frame while I was going to grad school. Um, I got yoga teacher certified. I started volunteering to teach veterans down at the VA, um, you know, just because it helped me so much. And then I ended up graduating um, from college, like with my master's in biology and I started teaching biology. And then it was at that point I had met my wife uh, my senior year of my undergrad. Um, and so she had also kind of given me like this foundation to like, I could lean into her because she was very stable and very put together. So I could lean into her as I weaned myself off opiates and like, you know, used yoga as a coping mechanism. Um, so we ended up getting married and then, you know, she started her career and we ended up having some kids and it just made sense because I wasn't able and I haven't been able to hold like a full-time job down, like since I got out. Um, so I've always been like making poverty level income. And so I just decided like, Hey, I'll be the stay at home dad. But that, 
I mean, a whole new set of emotions comes up, you know, when you're dealing with kids and babies and like, you just like, you, you feel the anxiety come back and like the overwhelming, you know, you feel overwhelmed at times because you got screaming and crying. And I mean, I was like punching holes in my walls at points. There's times where I'd throw a chair and it'd like break a door and my wife would get home. And she'd like, <laughs> can you explain like why? And she was worried about me, you know, she's like, well, what's going on? I'm like, I don't know. I'm just having a hard time coping. So it was almost like my coping mechanism of yoga had started to wear off and it was no longer working for me. And then when my second child was born, I started, uh, I had just had my second back surgery from, you know, military. And I, I was using, uh, I, I, I transitioned to jujitsu. And so I picked up jujitsu in 2000, I think it was like 16. I started doing jujitsu and that became my new coping mechanism, my, my new drug of choice. And my other son was starting school. So I had my youngest son from a baby and I would just bring him with me to jujitsu, you know, for the day practices. And I would just train like five days a week, you know, and use yoga to stay healthy. But it was like, that became my coping mechanism and my focus and my drive was like, I, I need to learn jujitsu, learn jujitsu. And so now I'm a brown belt, you know, but I'm also nice. like, my kids are in school and it's like, I have to have a career. And so like, I'm at this place now where it's like, I'm in this roller coaster of emotion where it's like, I, I don't, I don't have a skill set, you know, I don't have, I mean, I'm good at a lot of things like relatively, but I'm not an expert at anything. And so a lot of times I'll feel depressed cause I'm like, I'm 40. I'm like, I don't have, you know, I don't have that, the years of career building that most people have, you know? And so like a lot of times I'll feel lost and depressed. And so that's why I'm doing therapy with like the VA to try to like work through these traumas and, and process this stuff. Yeah, I was just gonna ask, um, so are they helping you realize why you're going through these types of emotions based off of your experience in the military? Yeah, so we're, we're, I'm doing the cognitive behavioral processing, which is like where I try to find my stuck points, which are belief structures that affect my actions. So like, you know, when you have a stimulus, right, and then you have a response. So I'm, I, I'm, I majored in biology and I have like, so I know a lot of biological stuff. So you, stimulus and response, you have a stimulus, the environment, will stimulate you and then you have a response to that and your belief structure is what controls your response. And so what we end up doing is we end up writing out, okay, like I feel this, like I feel this emotional response and then back up, okay, what was the triggering event? And then what is my belief structure about that event that makes me have this emotion? And then is there another way that I can reframe that belief structure that's less harmful than what it is? Mm. And so that's sort of the processing that I've been doing. Wow, Yeah, that's awesome. Um, that's an amazing perspective, man. Um, I, because now at least when you're going through these types of emotions, at least you know what's going on. It mm -hmm. sounds like there was a point in time where like, I would like, I, I, I go on these roller coasters where like, I just have to tell myself when I'm down and it's like, and I'm feeling like shit and I feel like, you know, I'm worthless and I, you know, I just like want to end it. You know, there's like, I just, I have a narrative there when I'm at the bottom where it's like, okay, this is the bottom, right? This is, this is where I'm at a low point and this is part of the ride of the roller coaster, right? Is that usually the, the cart comes back up, right? And so I just have to wait through those periods. And, and sometimes they last a day, sometimes they last a week, sometimes it's a month, two months, right? But they're always like, and it's just like the wrestling thing, right? With the arms, it's like, everything will end eventually. Like there will be a time when the flutter kick stop. There'll be a time where you can rest. Right. And it's like, you just have to like stick it out through those, like those, those low points. It's like, this is a low point, right? This is telling me that, you know, my pathway isn't aligned with my, with my goals. Right. But, and so I have to be able to just kind of process where I'm at in that point and try to start to work my arrow of trajectory back towards a goal. You know, and then usually once I'm back aligned, the, the positive emotion starts to return and then you can start to come back out of that dip. And it's like, and so you just have to know, like people that have trauma are going to do this, right? Yeah. You know? And what's interesting is even if you are aware of that, it doesn't help that dip feel any better because you're just going through it. And you yeah. can tell yourself over and over again, like, okay, I know I'm at this low point. I've mm -hmm. been here before. I know it doesn't last forever but it still sucks. sucks. Sucks so bad. So bad. It right? doesn't make it better to frame it like that. It doesn't make the feelings any better, mm -hmm. but it, it helps the perspective, right? right. It yeah. just helps the perspective. Cause it's easy when you're looking down 
to see a bottomless pit and feel yourself gravitate towards it, right? Like I just, you want to be consumed by it. You just want to end it. You're looking down. It's like you're ideating. It's like, but to have the perspective that, okay, this is like, I'm, I'm at a low point. There will be a, a, I can't see it yet, but there will be something ahead of me that's better. And just to like not give up when you're there, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the, I'm not going to quit life. I'm not going to quit my family. I'm not going to quit my kids, you know? Yeah. Like, so uh -huh. that's, that's kind of like holding me together too, is like having the kids. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. That helps big time. Um, well, awesome, Brad. Um, we're going to wrap it up, brother. Mm -hmm. Any last words? Yeah, I mean, like if 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 you're a veteran and you're looking for something that can you can kind of sink your teeth into, uh, martial arts, jujitsu is an incredible transition. Like, because you're in a combat situation often, right? Like, it's like you're fighting for your life, and and then learning to control your emotional state in those fights. You know, like when somebody's choking the shit out of you, or you know, breaking your arm, or something. You know, to be able to be stay calm and and figure your position out and like reverse the position or escape like those small victories do help right like and and so the martial arts learning a martial art is just it gives you confidence it helps your cardio um and then the yoga too like i mean if you if you've not done yoga before and are not like you know bit off a lot of it or giving yourself a good month of it or a, two months of it like most people try it once or twice they feel lost they're like it's not for me and they let it go you're going to feel lost. You're going to feel out of place. You're going to look around and people are going to be killing it. And you're going to be like, I feel like an idiot, but you have to stick it out for those 30 days, like, you know, 30, 60 days. Eventually there will be a switch that flips and you'll be like, ah, oh, I can actually like, I can be in my body. I can be in my mind without being consumed with negative emotion. Mm -hmm. And so those, those two things have really helped me. And like, I highly encourage anybody that hasn't tried them, you know, and are looking for something to sink their teeth into because they have that tenacity of being, you know, a veteran, a mission oriented. I need something to like push me forward. Those are two really good coping outlets that I would suggest trying. Mm -hmm. right. Right on, Brad. Thanks yeah. for being here. Um, appreciate you being vulnerable, man. To come take the seat, man. It's a mm -hmm. big deal. So thank you very much. Absolutely, man. It's my pleasure. Yeah. I got bad thoughts that make my mind scared. Hold me hostage and they don't fight fair. Who gon' pray for me and wipe on my tears? Who gon' save me if you not right here? Move this darkness and make my sight clear. Take me your way, cause I don't like here. Ghost of my past, they feeling the night air. Wake 